Hey guys, Miss Vinyan here, and we have Miss Prehor here too. Hi. Um, we are going to be doing Progressive Era Part Two video. So if you look at your um, learning target sheet, we're still on essential question: How did the progressives try to change life in the U.S. in the late 1800s and the early 1900s? Um, if you look down on learning targets, we're actually going to hit three major ones today um, that we'll cover in class. Describe the movement to achieve suffrage for women. Explain the role that um, Tennessee took in the passage of this and analyze the impact of the Great Migration and the differences between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Um, du Bois. So we're definitely going to be really focusing on these two. So I'm going to re-highlight these um, and then explaining the role in Tennessee as well. We're also still going to be talking about, still touching on some of the major goals of the Progressive Era. Okay, And we may not get to Great Migration today, but we will get to that in class. Okay, so those are all the things that we're going to be talking about. Make sure that you understand from last class period, we talked about populism, um, and then we also already talked about working conditions in the industries, including the use of labor. And that is, uh, we, I think we used uh, the triangle shirtwaist factory is what we'll be looking at, and also looking at goals of um, different progressive muckrakers. All right, so let's get started. All right, so what we have here, this is, uh, we did the four goals of progressivism last time, and you should be able to describe conditions in factories. Make sure that you can do that um, when you come back to class. All right, so some progressive political reforms. Uh, first of all, we start off with, we already know that political parties were corrupt and undemocratic. For example, you had political machines like the Tweed Ring, um, and uh, the political machines were controlling people. So the people figured out, um, in this progressive movement that the power has to be diminished to take it away from um, corrupt political parties. So people are given more power. So these are all the initiatives and I will um, go through these but I want you to write certain ones down. Okay. So starting in 1890 the secret ballot came about and this was where you could go in and you could obviously secret so you could vote without anybody knowing who you voted for. Before this you had to go get a ballot from your political boss who would hand you a ballot to vote for them. And then if you didn't vote, they would know, so they could threaten you. So the secret ballot will make uh, it anonymous when you vote, which will take away some of the uh, power from the political parties. The direct primary um, in 1902 is basically a place where primaries where you nominate candidates, and then you're going to basically vote on who's going to be the actual candidate to run. So uh, speaking for today in the presidential election, uh, the primary will happen before the actual election. The primary says who can actually run. Um, an initiative is going to give people more power because now the people have the power to propose a law. So if you have a law that you want to propose that's called an initiative, a referendum would be a law that when you go vote, it would say yes or no. Do you vote yes or no on this? So instead of letting the political parties decide yes or no, they put it back in the people's hands. A recall was a really effective one for political machines because people could um, do a recall on an election. So if you weren't doing what you're were supposed to as a candidate, they could recall and reelect. Um, Amendment 17 was the direct election of senators. Before they were just appointing senators and now you're able to um, actually elect who you want to represent you in Washington. So this will put the power back in the people's hands as well. And then we all know Ms. Vinyan's favorite one, Women's Suffrage, 19th Amendment. Um, and I think we've talked about that 857.3 times, but we all know women's suffrage is um, the very end of the progressive movement, it's 1920, so it's the very, like I said, it's one of the last things that happens in the progressive movement. Awesome, and so you can see at the bottom that's learning target um, 2.4, so what were some of their, we're still looking at that one, what were some of their goals? Some other goals in the progressive movement, the temperance movement uh, basically is about alcohol and um, abstaining from alcohol. So people thought society's problems were all based on alcohol. And so you have uh, programs like the WCTU, which is the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Anti-Saloon League. Those people are all against um, alcohol. So in 1919, at the very end of the progressive movement, the 18th Amendment is passed that enforces prohibition. So we're going to cover this when we talk about the Roaring Twenties which is funny that it's called the Roaring Twenties when it was the decade with no alcohol. Um, I guess it's because everybody was partying underneath ground. But the 18th Amendment um, is a progressive movement to end the sale of alcohol so that society will make better decisions. Um, other things that they tried to regulate were um, to make it illegal to bring women into the U.S. or across state lines. And this is the first passing of any laws against prostitution. 
Um, and also programs came up, um, like the YMCA. This is the beginning of the social gospel movement, where social people say it's um, the responsibility. Um, it's everybody's responsibility for the well-being of others. Okay, so you're your brother's keeper, so we should help those who need help. All right, some other ones. Um, we have the route. They started regulating railroads. The Food and Drug Administration, which we're going to actually get to more in the next video, um, had sanita uh, sanitary codes, and you could not mislabel your meat. So this is, like I said, if you think of the prog progressive era, these are all example examples of progress that is occurring in the United States. Um, this is one of your vocab words, Robert M. LaFollette. He is from Wisconsin, and he is very progressive. He's the first progressive governor. Um, he's a senator and a U.S. representative. And he uh, basically takes Wisconsin and kind of makes the example out of them to be a progressive state. Um, and so people call this the Wisconsin idea. He was the first one to initiate all of those recall, um, re-election, initiative, re referendum, all of those. Uh, were started in Wisconsin by Robert LaFollette. So a lot of people would call him one of the most uh, progressive governors. Also a time when they're trying to clean up the cities so that the political machines aren't taking control over them. And so um, they're going to lower utility rates. Utilities are your water, electricity, not really, not a lot of people had electricity uh, back then. But um, taking politics out of the process and also coming up with departments like Department of Education and, you know, Department of, you know, Security or Food. Um, and that would help, that would help organize things, okay? Also, during this time, there's a giant leap happening with African Americans. So when we talked about the Gilded Age, African Americans are, we have the Jim Crow, Crow laws and black codes. Now, this is still happening, but you start to see that you have certain people kind of rising up and discussing and talking, trying to get people to unite. We saw with the Populist Party, that's really important for a group of people to unite because they can make a difference. So the um, problem is with African Americans, many were ignored by regular progressives. So you have the progress progressive African Americans, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, which we will kind of, it, there'll be a recurring theme here for the next uh, couple units. But Booker T. Washington says to, um, take a lower status temporarily and just get as much education as possible. W.E.B. Du Bois did not agree with him. He's saying that is not good. We're not going to take a lower status. We're going to take what's ours and aim higher. So you can see the difference between these two um, will cause a little bit of static in the African American community. And we're going to be looking at some primary sources that discuss that. So just make sure you know the difference between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, for women's suffrage, and before 1910, the women's suffrage kind of splits up, but then um, it reunites back in 1890 with the National American Women's Suffrage Association. We call it NASA. Um, and the big leaders of that, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, whose name's not on here right now. But uh, we're going to be watching a video, and you'll Carrie Chapman Catt's in that. So two big strategies for women's suffrage is, first of all, like you can't just take the whole country and win women's suffrage. You have to do it state by state. Um, to pass a constitutional amendment, you have to have three-fourths of the states that agree. So you have to at least get 36 states. So in your vocab words, you've already went over uh, the perfect 36. So Tennessee would be the perfect 36. It would be the 36th state to pass um, the amendment. But they had the women had to go from state to state to campaign for women's rights. And each state had to pass that constitutional amendment. So some people, a lot of people, I don't know who, would say um, that they were against suffragists. Back then it was different because a woman a woman wasn't always working and a woman a lot of times was at home and a lot of people said, well, um, there's no reason for them to be voting. Here are the reasons why people were against um, suffrage. A lot of people would say women should stay at home, they're too physically frail, which we know is a lie, they're not smart or educated enough. Um, and they weren't educated enough, and that's because a lot of schools didn't take women. So they're saying women are high strung, they're emotional, they're not going to vote for war, um, this would make women masculine. And let me just tell you that 50% of the people who are anti-suffragists, they're against the women's right to vote, were women themselves. Um, and I think a lot of women were just afraid of change at that point. 
So in 1920, finally, the 19th Amendment was passed, and it said the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So what is important about this is, um, you know, we had the 15th Amendment that allowed African Americans the right to vote, um, and now it's going to, you know, before it didn't discriminate on color, now it no longer discriminates on gender. Um, Tennessee is important, like I said, because they're the last state to ratify. It came down to one person, and that would be Harry Burns, and he was one of your vocab words as well. Okay, so here's some other efforts that women are taking during this time period. So some examples of this are Planned Parenthood, where women could go and get advice about pregnancy, and they could get birth control. Uh, Margaret Sanger, she's the one of the first women who actually brings up this whole thing about birth control. She didn't invent it, but she helped in, um, help pass it out and helped it become a known thing. Florence Kelly, a uh, 10-hour day for women, so basically women shouldn't have to work. Maybe we, some people are in the country are doing 8-hour work day, and the women are still working on the 10-hour work day um, in the factories. Carrie Chapman Catt is the leader of the National American Women's Suffrage Party, um, and we're going to learn more about her when we watch our video that we're going to watch. So this is women's suffrage before 1920. So you see um, most of the West already got on board. They were very progressive, and they had equal suffrage. So if you were still confused about suffrage, remember suffrage means the right to vote. Um, Tennessee, partial suffrage. You can see in the middle region um, of the United States, like, it's partial. And then over here in the north and the south, there's no women's suffrage. All right. So that is going to bring us... That is it for today. So uh, the one thing that we didn't actually cover, we talked about um, in class a little bit with your vocab words, the Great Migration, where African Americans are moving from the south to the north. And that's primarily going to be uh, because of jobs, uh, industry jobs. And a lot of that will happen when we get to World War I. So we're going to cover it a little bit more then, too. So I want you to do your left side. I want you to do your summary. And then be ready to come in class. We're going to be discussing women's suffrage. And we will also be talking about Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Please make sure if you have any questions, you write those down and that you put them on the board when you get into class um, so that uh, we can answer those questions for a clicker quiz. All right, y'all say bye to Ms. Crehor. Bye. <laughs> See y'all next week. All right, y'all have a good night. Bye.